These are interventional radiology board view cases, and this is group one. Describe Lurie's syndrome. Lurie's syndrome is characterized by complete occlusion of the aorta below the renal arteries, as we see in this image, with loss of femoral pulses. Traditionally, however, Lurie's syndrome was defined by the presence of three signs and symptoms, loss of femoral pulses, thyroid butt claudication, and impotence. Which of the following is the most appropriate treatment option for this patient? The preferred treatment option is surgical bypass with reported patency rates of up to 90% at five years. List at least two collateral pathways encountered in aortoiliac occlusive disease. So there's more than two pathways, and we'll divide them into three groups, starting with systemic systemic collateral pathways. One pathway from aorta to external iliac occurs via intercostal, lumbar, iliolumbar, and internal iliac arteries. Sometimes lumbar, iliolumbar, and internal iliac arteries. Another pathway from aorta to external iliac occurs via the intercostal and deep circumflex arteries. And a third pathway from subclavian artery to external iliac artery occurs via internal mammary superior epigastric and inferior epigastric arteries. Visceral visceral collateral pathways include a pathway from aorta back to aorta via the SMA, arcuorelin, and IMA. The arcuorelin is a inconstant artery that connects proximal SMA or one of its primary branches to proximal IMA or one of its primary branches. A second visceral visceral collateral pathway from aorta back to aorta occurs via the SMA margery, marginal artery of Drummond and IMA. Lastly, visceral systemic pathways include a path from aorta to external iliac via the IMA, superior rectal, middle inferior rectal, and internal iliac arteries. In patients with occluded IMAs, another option would be from aorta to external iliac via the SMA, arcuorelin superior rectal, middle inferior rectal, and internal iliac arteries. These are bilateral angiograms. What's the traditional size definition of an aneurysm? A general definition of an aneurysm is when a vessel is one and a half times or greater than its expected diameter. List at least two complications of popliteal artery aneurysms. Popliteal artery thrombosis can occur in up to 40% of cases, limb-threatening distal embolization in up to 20% of cases, and nerve compression due to mass effect from the aneurysm. Which of the following treatments is a treatment of choice for popliteal artery aneurysms? Both surgical resection and arterial bypass are considered treatments of choice. Stenting is generally avoided if possible because these arteries um, aneurysms usually cross the knee joint. How frequently are popliteal artery aneurysm bilateral? Around 60% of popliteal artery aneurysms are bilateral. Here are some more DSA images of this same patient. How frequently do patients with a popliteal artery aneurysm also have an abdominal aortic aneurysm? Around 20% of popliteal artery aneurysms are associated with a AAA.
Which of the statements about sclerosing cholangitis is true? Statement A is true. 70% are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. The other statements are false. Sclerosing cholangitis most often occurs in patients' 20s and 30s, and most patients are men. Which of the following statements about sclerosing cholangitis is false? The false statement here is C. Statements A and B are true, and sclerosing cholangitis and cholangiocarcinoma are often very difficult to distinguish from each other on imaging. List three complications of sclerosing cholangitis. Complications of sclerosing cholangitis include stones, cholangiocarcinoma, portal hypertension, cirrhosis, and liver failure often potentially requiring liver transplant. Median survival in um, patients uh, with sclerosing cholangitis diagnosis is around 10 years. What's your best diagnosis? The best diagnosis in this case where we have severe diffuse stenosis of the right axillary artery, diffuse stenosis of the left subclavian artery, and severe diffuse stenosis and occlusion of the left axillary artery would be giant cell arteritis. What is a distinguishing feature between giant cell and Takayasu's arteritis? And a distinguishing feature between the two is more proximal vessel involvement by Takayasu's. Large vessel vasculitides are traditionally defined by involvement of which vessels? The answer here are the thoracoabdominal aorta and first order aortic branches above the diaphragm. Which of the following disorders can mimic giant cell arteritis on angio? And it turns out the answer is E, all of the above. Both vasospasm, acute trauma, and radiation can result in this kind of appearance of these smooth, long, diffuse stenoses. In a board's situation, uh, when we're shown a case where there's an isolated left subclavian artery occlusion in a young woman, giant cell arteritis and takiasus are things we think about first. However, um, if the patient happens to be an old man, um, we'd probably still think about atherosclerosis first above other diagnoses. Renal aneurysms in this location distribution may be observed in patients with what? So we have lots and lots of micro aneurysms that are quite close to the capsule of the kidney and not at the cortical medullary junction. Uh, the best answer in this case would be vasculitis and amphetamine abuse. Generally, mycotic aneurysms um, from things like, say, endocarditis prefer vessel bifurcations. This happened to be a case of polyarteritis nodosa. What's your diagnosis in this case? So we have here a patient with acute pancreatitis and associated pseudocyst. This is his DSA. Name two arteries in which pseudoaneurysms can happen due to acute pancreatitis.
So arteries involved may be splenic artery, left gastric artery, and the gastroduodenal artery. How often does major hemorrhage occur with acute pancreatitis? Major hemorrhages occur in approximately 1% of acute pancreatitis cases. Our next question doesn't have to do with acute pancreatitis, but uh, is sort of related to this subject. Non-traumatic visceral artery aneurysms occur most frequently in which artery? And the answer here is the splenic artery. What's your best diagnosis in this symptomatic patient? So we have occlusion of the ulnary artery segment overlying the hook of the hamate and pronounced underfilling of the digital arteries in an ulnar artery distribution, all typical findings of hypothenar hammer syndrome. However, if this weren't a hypothenar hammer syndrome case, what would your next, next best answer be? So the next thing on our list would be Berger's disease. The preferred treatment of symptomatic patients with hypothenar Hammer syndrome is preferred treatments are segmental resection or venous bypass graft. In patients who are asymptomatic and with an intact palmar arch, generally um, no intervention is usually necessary. And here's a CT image from three days later and a corresponding MPR. And what is your best diagnosis here? So we're seeing a type 1A endoleak. Here's a list just reminding ourselves of the different types of endoleak. And let's move on. Which endoleaks must be addressed in the operating room before completing the procedure? So type 1 and type 3 endoleaks must be fixed immediately. Which type of endoleak is most common? Type 2 Endoleaks are the most common and usually not immediately detrimental. Which of the following is not a method for treating a type 2 endoleak? So the first three answers are all strategies for dealing with a type 2 endoleak, embolizing a contributing artery with coils or glue. CT guided embolization of the aneurysm sac with glue. Fluoroscopically guided embolization of the aneurysm sac with glue. The fourth choice, intravenous administration of glue, would not be an option. What's your best diagnosis? So this is a DSA run from a patient with an acute pulmonary embolus. What's the estimated success rate when catheter-directed therapy is promptly initiated for acute PE? And according to the literature, the answer is C, over 80%. What's the most common catheter-based mechanical technique used worldwide to treat massive PE? And the technique here is rotating pigtail fragmentation.
What's your best diagnosis? So we see an internal external biliary drain in a patient with a type 1 colidocal cyst. Here's a simple illustration of the different types of colidocal cysts. And our next question is, which type is the most common? So the most common form of uh, colidocal cysts by far are type 1 List three complications of colidocal cysts. Complications of colidocal cysts include cholangitis, pancreatitis, liver failure, and cholangiocarcinoma. What's the gender distribution? So colidocal cysts occur in women about three times more often than in men. About over 90% of patients have some sort of anomalous pancreatic obiliary junction. What's your best diagnosis? Diagnosis here is a median arcuate ligament syndrome. We have an upwardly hooking, focally narrowed celiac artery on this lateral aortogram. Imaging findings in median arcuate ligament syndrome include So all three choices here are potential imaging findings in the setting of median arcuate ligament syndrome. What's first-line therapy? First-line therapy is to treat the cause, namely surgical ligation of the ligament. What's the normal course of the median arcuate ligament? So the median arcuate ligament meets the anterior aspect of the aorta superior to the celiac artery origin and passes anterior to the aorta. It can occasionally compress the celiac artery and even nearby structures like the celiac ganglion. So these are all DSA images from the same patient. What's your best diagnosis? So we are looking at images of a patient with fibromuscular dysplasia. Place an order of decreasing frequency, involvement of vessels in FMD. And this is the order. Renal involvement in about 60 to 75 percent of cases, cerebrovascular involvement in around 25 to 30 percent of cases, followed by visceral arterial involvement and limb arterial involvement. Which subtype of FMD is most common in renal cases? And the answer here is medial dysplasia. Here's a small table I've made, summarizing the different types. Intimal fibroplasia in under 10% of all cases of renal FMD. Medial fibroplasia, by far the most common, further classified into three subtypes. Medial dysplasia, um, seen in 80% of renal cases and most carotid cases. Perimedial fibroplasia in about 10 to 15% of renal cases. And medial hyperplasia in 1 to 2% of renal cases. Adventitial fibroplasia is uncommon. What's your best diagnosis?
So we were looking at DSA images of a patient with a type A aortic dissection. Which of the following may be associated with this dissection? So complications of type A aortic dissections include tamponade and coronary artery occlusion. In this patient, where does the true mint lumen communicate with the false lumen? And from the contrast jet, we can see that the communication point appears to be in the ascending thoracic aorta. The dissection flap in this case extends into which vessels? So we can tell by the smooth narrowing of the um, true lumen of branch vessels that both the brachycephalic artery and the left common carotid artery are also involved. What's the plasma expander of choice after large volume paracentesis in a cirrhotic patient? Our expander of choice is albumin, which has a half-life of up to 21 days. Other options like D and E, like dextran 70, for example, have much shorter half-lives of under 24 hours. Notice the patient's arm position. Which of the following may be involved in thoracic outlet syndrome? So in this patient with a um, left cervical rib, um, Subclavian vein and brachial plexus can be involved. The other option that we're not seeing here is the subclavian artery. Most common diaphragmographic group for thoracic outlet syndrome is and that would be generally women between the ages of 20 to 40. The um, Involvement of, um, of in, uh, in terms of gender uh, distribution is around three to one, women to men. Provide three differential diagnoses for this case. So in this patient with bilateral, relatively long segment renal artery stenosis in what looks like a some sort of visceral collateral pathway, things we would consider include atherosclerosis, FMD, neurofibromatosis, and takayasus. Here's another DSA run. Slightly delayed image from the same run. What's this vessel and why is it there? What we're seeing is the arc of real and filling due to an SMA occlusion. The, um, in this case, flow is going basically from inferior to superior within the visceral collateral pathway. And here's an illustration of what's going on here. Because of the SMA occlusion, the um, areas that would be normally supplied by the SMA are being supplied via the IMA to arc of real and, and then to the typical, um, I guess, supply area of the SMA. This happens to be a case of Takayasu's arteritis. For which condition may a patient with this anatomic variant be at risk for after a routine IVC filter placement? So 
So in this patient who has a duplicate IVC, the fear would be a recurrent PE if the duplicate IVC were not known and only one vena cava filter were placed. Here are some additional images from the patient's IVC uh, filter procedure. Provide at least three reasons to perform a pre-filter cavogram. So the pre-filter cavogram gives us a lot of um, options, uh, opportunities to see anatomic variants such as IVC duplication, a left-sided IVC, accessory renal veins, and circumaortic renal veins, all things that could affect how many and where we would place a vena cava filter. In addition, um, we also may be able to tell if uh, the patient's IVC may be too large to handle most standard vena cava filters. Which of the following is the most common complication of IVC filter placement? And the answer here is caval thrombosis. Axis eye thromboses occur in about 2% of cases. Filter migration, filter fracture, filter infection, and even death occur in under 1% of cases. Caval thrombosis has been reported to occur in up to 5% of cases. Which ablation therapy is associated with the most predictive imaging changes? The answer here is cryoablation. One of the big benefits of cryoablation is that the expanding ice ball is well visualized, whether you're using ultrasound, CT, or MRI, and provides more precise visualization than uh, what we see with heat-based systems. List appropriate, what's the least appropriate treatment option for a three centimeter HCC in a cirrhotic patient? And the treatment we probably want to avoid would be cryoablation due to increased bleeding risk and uh, DIC-like reaction uh, we call cryoshock. Which vessel is missing on this RAO arch aortogram? So the vessel we're not seeing filling is the left subclavian artery, and I've labeled the other vessels for you here. Um, here's a slightly more delayed image from the same DSA run, and also some additional DSA runs. What's the reason for the delayed left subclavian artery opacification in this patient? What we're observing is delayed filling of the left subclavian due to, um, from retrograde flow um, coming from the vertebral artery. If this were a young woman, which would be the most likely etiology of what we're seeing. So we'd be thinking about um, left subclavian artery um, occlusion in a patient with Takayasu's. What's your best diagnosis? We're looking here at a patient with Bud Chiari. Describe at least three signs and symptoms of Bud Chiari. So signs and symptoms of Bud Chiari include severe ascites, hepatosplenomegaly, pain, jaundice, vomiting, and extremity edema. What's the leading cause of Bud Chiari? And the leading cause is a hematologic abnormality. Treatments for Bud Chiari include So all of the above, medical management, tips, liver transplantation are all potential treatments for Bud Chiari. Generally, uh, recanalizing um, stenotic or occluded hepatic veins to restore venous outflow is the initial procedure of choice over things like angioplasty, stenting, or thrombolysis. Which of the following statements about TIPS um, stents is true?
The answer here is A, covered stents have better patency rates than bare stents. Basically, it's believed that bile is a thrombogenic substance that's able to go through the wall of a bare stent and into the lumen of a tip stent. So what procedure has been performed? So we're looking at images from a gonadal vein embolization for a varicose seal. Which of the following statements about venous rupture during this type of procedure is true? The answer here is all of the above. Sometimes during these procedures, the gonadal vein um, maybe um, ruptured. This is usually a self-limiting complication. Potential causes include venous spasm and aggressive ag catheter handling.